Hello and welcome to the Lesser Bonapartes, um, live from our cannabis yurt. <laughs> That's right. You see, we here at the, uh, well, I guess we're, we're doing an eastern border-ish, so I guess we're still the Lesser Bonapartes, but we'll call this show the Even More Eastern Border, because uh, oh, yes. Christops and Alice have condemned us to a work camp in Siberia, but you know what? The joke's on them, because guess what, assholes? We're in our element. We're among the step nomads now. Oh yeah, that's it. What, we uh, we what yeah, now? <laughs> oh man, we're just we're sipping on a, a on a skin of uh, fermented mare's milk, and mm -hmm. um, just we're gonna a, we're gonna just taking a giant rip in the cannabis yurt. Oh, yep. love it. Oh man, gonna be up er bright nearly tomorrow for uh, horseback target practice, and uh, maybe <laughs> uh, after a couple weeks of that, we'll go ahead and invade over those Caucasus Mountains like we've always been wanting to. Exactly. I mean, it's really it's the thing to do, but uh, yeah, yeah. In the in the meantime, in the meantime, we do have to pass the time some uh, some way. I mean, there is there is kind of a mean looking commissar uh, who keeps ordering us to go mine something called asbestos, uh, which wow. doesn't sound too bad. It has the word best in it, so that's pretty good. Yeah, be um, best is right there. His best is right in the word, but I think you know honestly we're gonna have to get ourselves out of this whole like uh, work camp situation. And I was thinking like, what's the best way to do that? And you know what, Glenn. We gotta free our asses, and our minds will follow. Let's just just talk about music, music in the Soviet Union. You know? Oh yeah, man. We're nothing if not a bunch of record store dorks, as uh, as as you all know <laughs> if you listen to us. So we're gonna pass the time by talking about Soviet pop music and um, some of our favorite examples and and what Soviet pop music was, uh, if you'll permit me, Daniel. Yeah, sure, please. Uh. Uh, pop groups, um, in the conventional sense, emerged only in the 1960s, as we are we are told. Um, and um, well, you would think that hey, this is the Soviet Union. How? Why would pop music be allowed? Well, we have to keep the people happy, as we are know we as we know, and <laughs> happiness is mandatory within the Soviet Union. <laughs> that is right. But there were there was uh, there was bu pop bureaucracy. I guess I'll call it. Yeah. And um, in the early '60s, some famous, some famous um, pop bureaucrats emerged, such as Claudia Shulzenko, Leonid Utsov, and Lyubov Orlova, or as they were known, the People's Beatles. Um, hey, all right. <laughs> no, I'm just, no, no, I'm kidding. Um, okay. But. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, every pop song written and performed had to first run through the um, the rigorous censorship, as we are told, of yeah. the uh, uh, probably not um, probably w was more like a DMV, but for some reason seems so ominous to me when I hear it. The Arts Council. Oh yes, um, <laughs> I've actually I've I've uh, I've read a little bit about the Arts Council before. And this is kind of roundabout, but I, I swear it's it's kind of related. But there is a there's a really cool uh, Russian science fiction author team, two brothers, the Strugatsky brothers, and uh, they wrote um, a a particular novel that I really enjoy called Roadside Picnic, which was later adapted into the Tarkovsky film Stalker. If you know that one. Oh, oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, but in the there's a, a new edition of Roadside Picnic came out, and uh, of course I snapped it up because uh, you know uh, I think they're fascinating writers, and it had a long introduction about the struggle to get the damn thing published <laughs> because you had to keep running it by the Arts Council, like your local art bureaucrat, and it's for a couple of uh, you know swinging Americans like ourselves who are used to you know doing whatever we want and you know maybe someone will catch up with us Th this idea of like running everything by you know yeah running everything by city hall basically before you could do anything with it is very it's it's interesting to think about but in this at the same time it doesn't necessarily mean that you wouldn't be able to create cool and interesting art like these Strugatsky brothers did it may not have been what they initially set out to do but even the final product that passes the art council has been some fascinating work and and I imagine a lot of these Soviet pop stars were kind of the same way. 
in a way because um you had to um you had to work within these these narrow confines officially officially um the only two types of songs allowed were either patriotic or lyrical mm-hmm. songs lyrical meaning you know fanciful you know i want to hold your hand type songs maybe um, right right not uh, emotions of that course, are approved yeah. of <laughs> Uh, yes, happiness emotions, you know, such as, you know, uh, you know, everything's you you could sing a patriotic song about how great the state was or you could write you know, a kind of a, oh what a beautiful sunset type songs, but right. you know, of course there was nothing provocatory could be written at all. Um yeah. which which um there was a very tightly knit composers union. There were um lyrics could only be written by what um poets um we have some names here: Dobra, uh, Dobran Ravov, um, Poz Desvinsky, uh, Tanich, Etin, uh, Derbenev. These are poets that the state um, considered "quote unquote" trustworthy. Um, <laughs> right. But you, you could, you could sneak a little bit in there. You could work. I mean, they weren't necessarily reviewing the musical content. Really, what they were concerned about was the. Um, was uh the the um the lyrical content really um yeah yeah so you could write a song that was kind of groovy if you wanted to um <laughs> at <laughs> well, the that's, time that was that was something that was kind of cool like the because i read a little bit about especially in the 60s these were like these groups that came out were called what was like vocal and instrumental ensembles like was the <laughs> yes. it wasn't even yes. bands they had like a like have an acronym via for these things and I and I I took a I took a couple for a spin. I went on YouTube, uh, you know, looking for a few of these uh, you know bands names that came up. And honest to God, the the closest sort of cognate I could think for us Western type folks is that, I mean, it sounds an awful lot like kind of flute rock, like Canned Heat maybe. <laughs> can't oh like are are like, like I think it's some a of the yeah, yeah. Canned Heat or some of the more like a uh, power ballady Kansas songs or Jethro Tull. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, or like Mamas but, and the we're, Papas. We're told, or... yeah. <laughs> Mamas and the Papas, yeah. With th- this folk rock music was the most common type. Like, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, yeah. In the 60s and the 70s, um, the predominant music that was allowed by the Arts Council um, was this folk music, this, you know, kind of flute, harp, um, heavy, um, traditional style um Soviet instruments were were used. Yeah. Um, and we were told also that um, and I read a great article here um, on a. There's um, if you ever wanted to learn as an American, I'm sure you know Chris stops being boots on the ground kind of scuff. But a site I really got into as I was uh, researching this was a site uh, a website called Russia Beyond the Headlines. Um, okay, yeah, with all kinds of with all kinds of cool stories in it, and we're told that a lot of these folk bands of the 60s and 70s were musicians but actually forced to perform by the government these songs starting in huh. the 1950s and the 60s to perform this folky type music this flute rock like you like you yeah, said yeah. which is which is perfect um because um <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah, cuz that's what it sounds like i listen to some you can find some tons of examples on youtube and i recommend you do that um uh, the arts council um you know kind of put out its Bible in the 1950s and um, about, you know, the guidelines of songs such as that could not um, lead to the destruction of Soviet society's moral values or demonstrated a quote, <laughs> lack of patriotism yeah. or another one. My, my, my personal favorite could not quote be an imitation of Western smut. Um, mm. And which is the other thing we wanted to touch on because what this Soviet propaganda and censorship was really trying to do was promote national values quote unquote yeah a, a music I, a musical identity that was antithetical to western music which at the time was you know the vocal groups um pop and rock and roll yeah which is funny because we were talking about this earlier about how in in the in the west in america they thought that Russia, uh, rock and roll was sort of the decadent music that would lead to communism. <laughs> right. Oh, no. that's, uh, it's cool that you bring up the, uh, that those guidelines about like, you know, this music should uh, encourage, you know, good citizenship and, you know, not corrode morals because that's the same line that all of the, like, 
moral guardians in the United States were doing about rock and roll. Like, both of these, and I thought that was really interesting to think about for, like, what are supposedly diametrically opposed regimes like the hyper-capitalist United States of the post-war era and the, you know, the socialist Soviet Union were still both really concerned with making sure that, like, kids didn't shake their groove things too much. <laughs> yeah, they both... Well, yeah, whereas... I guess, yeah, the ultimate thing... I guess, whereas in in the West, in America at the time, in the 1950s, um, kind of the, the backlash to rock and roll went hand-in-hand, hand, really with, um, you could say, it was a segregationist thing. It was mm -hmm. led by these moral authorities that didn't like the idea that, um, you know, white kids were dancing with black kids and listening to what they called at the time race records. Right, um, right. Things like that. So that was kind of, it was tied up with that. Whereas in Russia, it was more along the lines of, I think it was like, well, you know, they're going to start dancing and having a good time and think that, Hey, this stuff coming from America is okay. We don't hate the Americans. We like we this little yeah, yeah. little Richard guy sounds all right. I mean, if they're having this much fun in America, why should we hate their way of life? Right. It kind of undermines yeah. the the concerted propaganda effort that the Soviet state had and really all the Eastern Bloc regimes had to try to depict the West as this unending grind of misery. And, and honestly, like that's. No. You know, that's the same picture that you and I grew up with of the Eastern Bloc here in the States, it, which, you know, it may have been a little closer to the reality, but at the same time, one of the, and I will say one of the cool things about uh, Christophs' project with Eastern Border, d despite the fact that he uh, overthrew us and sent us to this Siberian work mm. camp, but one of the cool things about it is that, like, by getting this kind of perspective about how people actually live their lives, you know, it wasn't just everyone going around with slumped shoulders humming Volga boat song all day long <laughs> like people right. people were living their lives and one of the cool things that I looked into uh, when we were talking about like what we want to talk about in pop music in the Soviet Union is the various ways that uh, people actually subverted these attempts at state control um, and probably the absolute best one that I discovered and I honestly I had no idea this was a thing, and it has become my new favorite thing in the world, Glenn. And this is a kind of... Uh, so So your listeners are probably familiar with the term samizdat, and this was a term for like the underground publishing industry at the time. It was basically like you would have uh, publications or pamphlets that were not state-approved, but a, a dude had a mimeograph machine that he stole from, you know, people's office block 1A and took into his basement, and you're running off, you know, uh, these unapproved pamphlets. And so there was a movement called Magnetizdat, which was the creation distribution of censored music via dubbed magnetic tape. But even better than that was a phenomenon called Rundgenizdat, so what does that mean? Well, remember, a fellow named Röntgen is the guy who discovered X-rays. So this was a kind of pirate music distribution where Soviet citizens would go dumpster diving at hospitals and pull out the plastic X-ray films, discarded plastic X-ray films, and cut records out of them. They would use this plastic and mold the copied groove of like someone got a hold of say it was usually jazz it was usually basically it was what the Amer american toffee noses were calling race music in the 50s mm. it was these jazz records these rock records they would get a hold of them uh and would cut out you know like a like a you know a record uh out of these plastic x-ray films and then press the the record groove into them and make a flexi now, i don't know you know if uh, everybody out there knows like a flexi used to be this kind of uh, sort of disposable single that could be inserted into a magazine, you know, this kind of thin plastic thing. And what's awesome about these is that, like, so many of these would still have images of bones on them. And oh, that's I, awesome. I, I can't. I, I want to do that now. I want to do it so bad. I want to like <laughs> how fucking DIY to take fucking images of like rib, and they were they were referred to as in the slang as bones or ribs. You would like go looking for ribs, and it would be like these images of a rib cage or a skull with fucking St. Louis blues pressed into it that you put on your record player. And that is just like, 
the beautiful metaphorical levels to like unfurl in that are just awesome and it really like the spirit <sighs> of the you know the, the the soviet people these soviet citizens is really incredible uh one thing that was kind of interesting to learn is that the the kind of we tend to think of the ussr as this one unit but there was a lot of variation in the various constituent republics so in the in the proper russian federation the state control over music was a lot it was a lot more effective so what you had was in the kind of the border republics like say Kristaps's own latvia you had a lot less state control over music and that's actually where some of the first soviet rock and roll bands got together um i was reading in an article that uh one of the first rock and roll shows ever played in the soviet union was a bunch of dudes in a latvian factory played a show for their co-workers uh playing chuck berry covers uh just like just a fucking pop-up show and I mean that's fucking rock and roll as hell. <laughs> I mean it's yeah. it's really pretty amazing. And uh and, and there were, you know, and to even to even get to the point where you could cuz you think about like the, the the state control over everything or attempted state control over everything also meant that it was really hard to get a hold of an electric guitar. <laughs> like that was like yeah. unless you were part of one of these state approved, you know, vocal groups, these these flute rock vocal groups that Glenn was talking about. It was really difficult to get a hold of any instruments. So you know what these guys did? They fucking built their own. They would cut guitar bodies out of like tables, like solid wood like tabletops, and they would use wire, like sort of like uh like you know, copper wire or whatever wire they get the hold of for the strings, and use telephone receivers as the pickups. On these and that's DIY motherfuckers. Like that's <laughs> Oh wow, yeah, that really is. <laughs> that's not even that's not even like it's one thing to go out there and like rent a Telecaster and bang out some tunes with your with your pals in the garage. Like that's pretty damn DIY. When you have to go out there and build your own guitar to do that, my hat is off to you. That is some serious rock and roll spirit. Yeah, yeah. I even uh, I even uh, I even came across an old uh, Maximum Rock and Roll article from the '80s, where they sent somebody to kind of do a dispatch about underground punk rock in in Russia at the time in the Soviet yeah. Union. And um, uh, what I thought was hilarious is that um, the guy was kind of saying that the music resembled more like uh, what was what would be called college rock at the time, like kind sure. of like a fuzzy kind of pop sound, like yeah, um, yeah. like like like, uh, like uh, say the Feelies, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. I'm trying to think maybe, of like maybe, jangle yeah. pop bands. <laughs> maybe like yeah, yeah, the Feelies or the yeah, the Feelies Good Earth albums or some of those other ones like that. Um, some of those early bands like My Bloody Valentine or something, um, where because uh, they didn't really know from punk rock. It was hard enough to get punk rock albums in the '80s in America. They just sure. kind of would read about punk rock and then do what they thought punk rock sounded like. So it ended up being kind of a fuzzy folk music, which That's is kind of what awesome. we're talking about. Like yeah. we're, we're talking about REM, really. I mean, you know, um, sure, <laughs> right. or, uh, or or Echo in the Bunny Man or something, or I don't know. <laughs> Uh, one of the, one of those, some of those uh, uh, pop bands, some of those, uh, yeah, some of those like Sarah Records bands from the late '80s, early '90s in the UK. Um, oh, yeah, some of those. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know that much about those type of bands, so sorry. Uh, um, you, you you wouldn't like them. It's very twee. <laughs> oh yeah, probably. What's that? The wedding, the the wedding present, or one of those bands? Uh, yeah. Yes, and the wedding present is amazing. But yeah. So that, that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of those. And so I was like, so I thought that was pretty cool too. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the evolution of uh, Russian pop music in the Soviet uh, era. Unless uh, you have anything else to add there, Daniel. Well, th there's one other thing I wanted to mention, and that's the kind of the dawning discovery of how powerful rock and roll and pop music could be in kind of the the 70s and 80s, and and it's not so much. I don't think it's a matter of the actual music itself being revolutionary, but I think there's something about pop music that can help people express what they're already feeling. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think... Because the, the, the Carter administration and the Reagan administration actually made it policy to play a lot of Western pop music and, uh, and, and rock music over the Radio Free Europe radio channels these were like radio stations that were specifically built to broadcast into the soviet union so that 
anyone in the Soviet Union who had a radio could pick up on them and hear the voice of the West almost. And I read that there was um, there was actually controversy in the Reagan White House, those old fuddy-duddies, about whether they even ought to be encouraging using such degenerate music even in the cause of toppling communism. <laughs> <laughs> It would be in Reagan's America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just, he just wants another. He just wants a a, a fine um, you know swing combo at the malt shop, I guess. But right. uh, but there was still you know even the Soviet regime like uh, I think like they they started recognizing that people enjoyed it and you could let these things in. Like Elton John was one of the first Western pop performers to perform in the Soviet Union, and I think it was 1979, something like that. And then, when, of course, with Gorbachev, with Perestroika, the openness policy, you know, it just all came flooding in. And it, and I, and I think it's more, there, there are some people talking about the role that rock and roll played in the collapse of the communist regime. And I don't think it was a causation thing, but I think it was very much a matter of, here was a new avenue of expression, a new way to, I, I, one of my favorite things that just as an aside that I learned about was like in the 80s, uh, especially, there was a particular genre, I forget what it was called, I, I should have taken a note, but there was a particular like type of writing you would do in music, where you would be writing lyrics that were on the face of them, uh, critical of the United States and the Western regimes and like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, but really they were clearly about Gorbachev and the Soviet regime, right? <laughs> Which is just again nice. that awesome DIY spirit in uh, in the in the hearts and minds of the people who lived under these regimes, and I, and I really think like it would be it would be too much to credit rock and roll with toppling communism, but I think it made it rock and roll and pop music helped make the times that much more exciting for everybody when it when it was when they could see that it was all coming crashing down it was a way for them to engage with those feelings and uh and you know i i i think i i can speak for both of us glenn when we say that pop music and and rock music in its in its infinite variety especially are are things that are very important in our lives that's something that we have both uh it's something that just taps into our soul in a very real way and to think about the way that it is that it helped to think about the way that it affected these people, you know, living under the Soviet regime in a, in a similar way and touch their hearts in these kinds of ways. It's very interesting and uh, to think about. And I, and I like to think, I like to think that you and I would have put together one of those like banging together on homemade guitars kind of bands. Maybe. Oh yeah. I, th I think that, I don't, you I know, don't, yeah, when okay. you go into the history of music, when you go into the human, you know, relationship with music ever since the first guy, you know, you know, hit a rock twice with a stick. I mean, there's just nothing that's there. I mean, I, I really don't, yeah. I don't really think that music is a luxury. I think it's a necessity to the human condition. Um, and I think that it's a universal language. Um, so I think that I definitely, you could say that it was part of the exciting times and a way of saying like, hey, can, can the United States be so bad? You listen to this Chuck Berry song. They're having a great time over there. Um, you right. know, so it, could, it brought us together. I mean, so... Yeah, exactly. It's it's uh it has a very you know a kind of universalizing effect, but yeah. So I think uh, all right. It looks like uh, actually I can I can see it now. Uh, yeah, it looks like some step nomads have rolled up. They've been jamming down oh. on some of their step string instruments. That commissar is boogieing. I can see it. Oh, oh man. Oh yeah. So here's what we do. We blackmail them. I'll go over there wow. and and we'll say we saw you. We're gonna report you to the commandant unless you let us go. And we'll be out of here in no time, and we'll rest our show back from Christophs and Alice. Although a fine job they did in hosting, but I mean, come on, we need to be back on top. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll do that. But first, let's let's fashion some crude instruments out of wood and telephones, and then like just jam <laughs> out on like Hawkwind Space Ritual album for a while with these guys. Hell yes, I'm into it. <laughs> All right, and we'll be back, and we'll take our show back. And we'll show you Kristaps with the power of rock and roll. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, The Eastern Border. 
www.ltd.lv and will rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The eastern border salutes you.